Welcome to the third episode of SciCam. Uh, it's time to point you live from inside the Trinity College clock tower. I'm Michael Contario. I'm joined by the keeper of the clock, Dr. Hugh Hunt. Hi, Michael. It's great to be here. Um, so, yes, basically, basically um, as part of his job, as well as being an engineering fellow here at uh, Trinity College and University of Cambridge, uh, Dr. Hunt is responsible for looking after this wonderful pendulum clock. So. Uh, can you just tell us a little about what, what is this? Well, it's, uh, it's 102 years old. Um, there's been a clock here for 402 years. The original clock, in fact, is still running in a village nearby. But we're very lucky that 102 years ago, we were given this fantastic clock, accurate to perhaps a second every two or three months. And um, I'm really just interested in finding out how accurate it can be if you really uh, push it to its limits. It's, it's not in any special environment. It's quite cold here. I <laughs> yes. put my uh, coat on because it's getting a bit nippy. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's uh, fantastic to be able to just see what a clock can do in fairly ordinary circumstances. And so you, you've actually set up um, a monitoring safe system. Oh, on this. well, that's right. And. Uh, on the pendulum, which you can probably see swinging here in the background, the pendulum swings once every three seconds. There's a little optic sensor on the back, uh, which picks up the, the motion of the pendulum. And there's a GPS receiver up in the window behind there, which picks up, apparently to nanosecond accuracy, the real time from satellites. And that data is compared in a computer system and streamed onto the web, and anyone can look at it. In fact, if you're uh, if you want to go to it right now, uh, there's a link I think on the page. Uh, yes, um, if you can't see the link, it's www.trin, which is short Trinity, dot cam dot ac dot uk, and if you slash go there, clock, yeah, uh, slash, slash clock. You want to get the um, but um, if you go there, you can see it's updated every three seconds. Well, it's updated every three seconds, but it only it updates a new package every three hours. So the data is uh, refreshed every three seconds. But what I might do in uh, in the next few minutes is I'll just send a, an an update, so you will get the latest data. Okay. So um, what sort of things actually affect the timing of the clock? You already said it's it's in quite a chilly open atmosphere. Well, it's chilly chilly right now, but in the middle of the summer it'll be quite hot. But one of the most uh, amazing things you might think about is that if you imagine a pendulum which is swinging and, uh, well, the period of a pendulum depends on its length. And uh, thermal expansion, thermal expansion coefficient is typically, say, uh, one part in 10 to the 5 per degree. So 10 degree temperature difference maybe 20 degrees between summer and winter. <laughs> yes, that's only feeling like that now. Yeah, well, that's it. That's, that's, that's um, two parts in 10 to the 4 in length. Uh, and then that means, well, it's 10 seconds a day, or perhaps even 20 seconds a day difference between summer and winter. Now, this pendulum is temperature compensated. And it's very neat because it's got a steel tube on the outside. And then on the inside is a zinc tube. And then another steel tube, and zinc's thermal expansion coefficient is two and a half times that of steel. And if you make the amount of steel going downwards two and a half times longer than the amount of zinc going upwards, they cancel each other out. So this pendulum here is temperature compensating, which means from summer to winter, it runs the same. The other thing that's interesting is uh, barometric pressure. Now, this is the wackiest thing you might ever imagine about a clock. It depends on barometric pressure. Why? Well, if you compress the air, it becomes more dense. And the pendulum is sitting in the air, just like Archimedes in his bathtub. There's a buoyancy force. And that buoyancy force, small though it is, depends on the density of the air, which depends on pressure. And it turns out, and you can check this up on the website, it's 8 milliseconds per day per millibar of pressure, which means that if the pressure today is, well, we can look it up, but well, I can look it up right now. But anyway, if the pressure today is, say, 1020 millibar, and if tomorrow it's 1010 millibar, that means 
the clock's going to go 80 milliseconds a day faster, which is roughly a second a week. And that's a huge effect. So I have designed and installed up here a barometric compensator. And if you click on the left-hand side of the web page, you'll find the link to find out all about the barometric compensator. Thank you very much. Um, well, the, the, you, you found that there's one problem that you kept on having that, well, uh, that, that, that was coming in at a specific time of the hour during the day. Well, look, you know, the, the, thing about, the thing about dealing with machines is that nature, bloody nature, always gets in the way. You know, uh, you might, you've got a fantastic car, and then you discover that uh, a cat sleeps in the engine, in the, under, the, under the bonnet, uh, because it's nice and warm overnight, and and then the next morning it gets jammed in the fan belt, and poor cat, but you know it, it screws up your fan belt. Okay, my cat story is to do with pigeons. Now you can imagine on a on a clock dial that okay, this is uh, twelve o'clock, and then as the the time goes by, you've got uh, I'm going to do this right way around. As the time goes by, that's the wrong way around, isn't it? No? Uh, it's okay, it's just mirrored for us. It is looking the right way around. Okay, so as the time goes by, that's sort of quarter past twelve, half past twelve, quarter to one. And if a pigeon were to come and stand on the minute hand at a quarter to one, well, that's going to stop the clock. And I had all sorts of issues. Well, the first thing was to try and figure out why was the clock stopping at random times? And then after about two years of this, uh, me and a mate, we said, okay, let's try and figure out what is the, is there any consistency? So we wrote down all the times. Remember, we did this on a piece of paper and I was reading them out and my friend was writing them down. And we thought, hmm, 7.43, 8.45. 6.47, they're all 40-something, what is going on? And it just dawned on us, you know, you said, pigeons, anyway, and sure enough, uh, that was, uh, that's what it was. On uh, sometime about last year, I can't remember exactly when, uh, I installed a pigeon wire, which is a, just a wire, uh, thin wire on the minute hand. You can barely see it from the ground. There's a photograph of it on the web page. And we got a cherry picker in to install this uh, wire. Now, the pigeons must have known. I mean, I, I am now a great believer in the, you know, the, the uh, paranormal. Because these pigeons flocked in their hundreds that morning, and they sat on the minute hand for the best part of an hour. They stopped the clock on the last possible, only an hour and a half before this wire was going to be installed. They stopped the clock for the best part of an hour that morning. They'd not done anything like it until that morning. How did they know? I mean, you know, the, the pigeon telegraph was out, you know, they were checking their, their tweets, and they... Uh, it was just ridiculous. Anyway, no pigeons since then. Uh, uh, that's good. Um, if you've got any questions that you'd like to put to um, yeah. Dr. Dr. Hunt, uh, then you can type those in into YouTube or on our Google Plus page. There's also, I've got uh, a, uh, a Twitter uh, um, feed for the clock, and it's called Clock Keeper. Just in, it's got two Ks in it, Clock Keeper. So if you want to... Um, uh, uh, receive tweets from Clockkeeper, then I'll keep you posted in, as to what's going on up here. Uh, uh, but for now, we're heading over to another of our SciCam presenters, uh, Deborah, who has got a beginner's guide for us. Hello, Deborah. Uh, <laughs> hi. Is this switched to me yet? Yeah, yeah we're, we're reading you loud and clear. Go ahead. OK, great. Uh, so, this is now the second clock I've looked into. I actually managed to go up Big Ben once, so it was a little bigger on the inside, but seemed to work similarly. Uh, but I have a question. Oh, no, he's leaving. I have a question. I'm not leaving. I'm just, I'm, I, there we go. Fine. I'm here. Thanks. Um, 
So if the pigeons sit on it when it's about at 15, does it make it go a little faster from their weight pushing it down? Oh, well, that's an excellent question. It doesn't. The thing is, it, it didn't actually make the clock. The pigeon sitting on the ha the minute hand at quarter to the hour didn't make the clock go slower. It just would stop the clock. Um, so it would work fine up until there were enough pigeons to stop the clock. If you have them sitting on the on the minute hand at quarter past the hour, well, it just works fine. Now the analogy is this. Imagine you've got enough power in your car engine to go up a hill at a certain speed, uh, and then, but once you get to a, a hill which is just too steep, then your engine stops. In other words, it, it, you can you can put your cruise control on, and the cruise control will go at 60 miles an hour on level, or on two degrees, on four degrees, no problem. But as soon as you get to six degrees. It just counts out. In other words, it works perfectly up to a limit. But if you're going downhill, then actually there's no problem because you, know, you can just use your brakes and you can go down any steepness of hill up to a point, of course. But going up the hill, there's a limit. And the limit on my clock is two pigeons. Um, but I can have as many pigeons as I like on the, uh, on the other side. All right, okay. good to know. So yeah, I'm on a totally different topic today, so I'm actually going to talk about swimsuit material. So I do apologize for doing this with my hair all wet, but this is what happens when I come straight from a swimming lesson. So being a swimmer and also a chemist, I was fascinated by what people swim in, because actually back, well, way back in the day, back around the Greeks, people used to swim naked, which has an entirely different section of society that I'm not going to go into at this particular time. And then back a couple hundred years ago, people were a lot more concerned about their modesty. So they would swim in full-length dresses, or men would swim in trousers and a vest. So this was definitely good for conserving their modesty, but considering this was a lot of material and it was cotton, this really was not very good for their speeds, which was why the 50-meter swim times in the first Olympic Games was about twice as long as it is now, which is a huge, huge difference, considering Michael Phelps is thrilled when he can shave off a million, or sorry, a thousandth of a second. So swimming material is definitely important for amateur swimmers like me or you. I mean, you want something that dries quickly, you want something that's relatively resistant to chlorine. But it's a really big deal for Olympic swimmers. So clothing style and fabric are important in every Olympic competition, but it's really important in swimming because water is really dense, so it's difficult to move through. So if you think of yourself, you know, just walking along the walking to work, let's say, normally it doesn't matter much what you're wearing, assuming it's appropriate for work. On a windy day, you maybe don't want all that billowing fabric because it'll really be pushing at you when you're walking. And now think of if you've ever tried to walk on a beach, for example, any of the water that's getting up is just that much more difficult to move through. So Olympic swimmers were really anxious for anything they could get that would make it just that much better for them to move through the water. So around 20 years ago, Speedo became the first company that really utilized this. And they developed a material that used biomimicry to copy shark skins, because sharks are one of the fastest swimmers. And the thing with shark skin is there's lots of V-shaped ridges on their actual skin. And this directs water flow nice and smoothly over the body. Otherwise, water comes from all these different directions, and it collides. And when water collides on the swimmer, it produces drag, and this really slows them down. Again, not necessarily a difference you or I would notice, but certainly a difference that Michael Phelps would notice. So Speedo copied this material, and they put lots of V-shaped ridges into their swimsuit. And this was a huge success. Swimmers were going just that little bit faster in the Olympics. And so, of course, every Olympics, every four years, they want to beat their previous material. So all the major swimsuit companies, Speedo, Jared, whatever you're looking at, they'll spend four years developing the next big material for the next Olympics. So we gave, made minimal progress for the next few years. And then in the Beijing Olympics in 2008, there was huge progress because they incorporated plastic into their swimsuits. So when you think of a swimsuit, you don't really think of plastic. But think about a different area of your life. Think about, for example, if you're going for a night out. Back in our parents' day, this was a lot more common. You'd have those very tight, like, corsets or girdles. 
that's of course to hide in the material the parts of your body that you don't really want to show but for swimmers they want to pull in just any little extra bit of fat muscle anything to make them perfectly streamlined moving through the water so that they just have that much less resistance so by adding this plastic to the swimsuits it's really tight material it could really pull in on the swimmers bodies to make them perfectly streamlined in addition you all probably you know wrap something in a plastic bag for example if you don't want to get it wet plastic is relatively hydrophobic which means it doesn't like to interact with water so by adding this to the swimsuit you actually had minimal interaction with water in these parts of the suit and so that was even less drag and it was even easier for swimmers to move through the water the problem with this is the increase in times is even more than they'd expected from this so they looked at it a little more and they realized there was t thousands of tiny air pockets in the plastic now if you think of a swimmer sitting on the water they'll have most of their body underwater with just a little bit above and as i said water is really difficult to move through and what these little tiny bits of air were doing is they're actually pushing the swimmer just slightly higher in the water so they're having a little bit more of their body in the air and that was making it so much easier for them to move through the water so speedo incorporated just a little bit of plastic into the swimsuits and it had a huge effect so speedo's italian competitor competitors thought well we need to deal with this so they made entirely plastic swimsuits and they were so amazing that 43 world records were broken at one swimming competition, which was unheard of. So, of course, everybody complained, everybody that hadn't broken a record. And they looked into it and found it all these tiny air pockets, and they decided that it was technological doping. So, technological doping is a relatively new thing that's come about in recent years because there's been so much advances in material science with all these new carbon that you're looking at, all these other things, that in sports such as the Olympics, it becomes a concern as to whether the skill is actually coming from the athletes or coming from the materials. And in the case of these plastic swimsuits, it was determined that it actually was the materials. So they were classified as technological doping, and they're not allowed anymore. That's why you'd actually notice that the swimming times this year in the Olympics were, sorry, last year now, were slightly lower than the times from four years ago. But the big scandal is that they didn't want to take away the legitimately won records, the 43 records caused by these entirely plastic swimsuits. So it's now argued that there are 43 world records that are never going to be broken. So as a swimmer, I just think this is absolutely incredible because I'm working my ass off in the pool trying to get my fitness up. And then I find out I could be doing it through science and gaining the same. So hopefully you find it just as interesting. Michael, any questions? Uh, yeah, as, just um, going back to the bit about the sharks, you were talking about uh, making the water flow more smoothly over it. Yeah. Is, is that a similar thing that's done it with um, when, when they actually like work on looking at golf balls and the like? I, I, I seem to recall reading something about go, the dimples on golf balls actually helping um, disrupt the turbulence and allowing golf, golf balls to fly further than a, like a truly spherical ball would. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, everyone knows that there's all the divots on the golf balls, and that has a couple benefits. Partly, when you hit them, contacting a completely spherical surface, you wouldn't get much contact with it, whereas when you have the divots, you can get more contact, so that helps a lot. But then also, when it's flying through the air, probably spherical would be better, but the curves are better if you have water or dirt or anything that comes into contact with it, because it gives it somewhere to go, rather well, than well, just disrupting well, the about that because the um, what happens is that if you imagine a sphere and the air comes along the sphere and if it's perfectly smooth it doesn't separate from the surface and the the power required to bring the air back around and pro provide, provide, provide nice laminar flow is greater than if you get the separation to occur just at the maximum diameter so it's about getting separation to occur in the right place. You need just enough roughness to get the flow to separate. Not too much, not too little. And those dimples are just, just about right. And in fact, on ships as well, uh, if, you, uh, you, uh, if you're making a model ship to simulate what a real ship, a full-scale ship does, you put little turbulence generators at the front of the ship to make sure that it's the same turbulence regime as you get on the ship. Turbulence is quite the quite a complicated thing.
<laughs> and I guess in every sport, we're trying to beat it, basically. Yeah, and look, can I just, uh, I, I can't believe that you're really trying to beat those uh, swimming records. <laughs> I'm trying to beat my own swimming records, not Michael Phelps. Oh, I see, okay. Hi, so we're here in the uh, Trinity College clock tower with uh, Dr. Hugh Hunt. Um, hey, I've got to do some winding. Yes, um, we're going to uh, now wind up uh, the clock. <coughs> well, just talk, talk us through what you're actually doing to the clock here. All right, well, the, the clock, uh, see, I've got, this, uh, I've got this winding handle here, which is really great. If I wanted to commit the ultimate Cambridge <laughs> mystery murder up here, I've got the perfect weapon. Uh, but this, uh, this winding handle, uh, well, there's four places I have to wind, and there's huge weights that are about 200 kilograms each that go right the way down to the bottom of the tower. Because we're up here, we're a, we're a good um, sort of 20 meters up off ground level here. And I'm going to put this winding handle on here, and off we go. And I have to do this one for you, and it's bloody heavy. I'm not going to do it at all. You're going to have to turn the button box off. I'll give you one over there to do. So I can see the weight coming up the top. Um, there you go, that's where it's got. And that's, uh, well, in fact, I've done some winding yesterday, so it's only one seventh of the job. There's another four to do, another three to do here. You're going to have a go. Yeah, let's start on this side, right? There we yeah. go. So how 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 much um, how how quickly do the uh, weights actually go down then? Well, that's about um, what from up there down to there is a day. That's uh, yeah, it's about that distance multiplied by seven. Uh, there you go. Off you go. You can see that I'm actually on my knees here. That's, this is the the correct height, but then we lose our heads. So. It's quite noisy. Yeah, it is noisy, but that's the way it is. And um, it might be, I don't know whether it's worth turning your webcam over and have a look at the weights on the next one. Um, yes, if you okay. if you carry on there, and I'll, and I'll do the next one, so you'll be able to see the weights. So you need to stop coming up, you need to stop at that. Right, stop. Good. Right. Yeah, so we, 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 we've turned the webcam around so we can actually see the weights. Okay, so uh, I'm going to do the landing now. And uh, nearly up the top. Got another couple of wires to go. And there we go, that's up the top. And there's one more to do, which is the far one. If you can still see, you'll have another one. Uh, this one here, there we go. And that's the little one. 